Dinner and a Book is supported by the Rex and Alice A. Martin Foundation of Elkhart, celebrating the spirit of Alice Martin and her love of good food and good friends. impact on British society of the Great War. Let's discuss the Great War in Modern Memory by Paul Fussell with my guest Doug Farmwald, who is no stranger to the literary history of war. Welcome. Oh, yeah. How are you? Today? I'm great. Good. Thanks for having me. I wanted to ask you, you know, this book has such an impact on people that love history mm -hmm. and particularly history of war and the literature and the cultural impact of war. How did you discover this book? Well, around a couple years ago, around the centennial, centennial of, the, of the World War I, I was reading more on it, and this book popped up as, as a good resource. And I have a cousin-in-law who teaches English at the University of Texas. Um, and one of the things she teaches is great war literature, and she highly recommended the book. So it's been on my to-read list for a while. Oh my gosh, I'm glad you suggested it. At first I thought, oh, this is going to be a slog. And then I got pulled into it. And that's why you don't give up on books the first 10 pages. Exactly. You keep going. Right. And uh, it is so interesting. Um, this American writer is drawn to British. He's an Anglophile. He's, well, and for the longest time, I presumed he was British. I did too. I kept thinking, where is he teaching at Rutgers? But mm -hmm. is he? Because he kind of becomes British in a way. I think so. Yes, and a lot of Americans like that. They mm -hmm. like to float into the, you know, the accent and the history. I can't do the accent. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's talk about what we're making today. Let's talk about your broad approach. Well, basically, I thought, you know, let's do comfort food. Um, yes. Because so much of this is about the, the juxtaposition of life at the front and life at home because the soldiers would cycle through, they're on a rotation, and so periodically they would get home. Well, what, would, what were they longing for at home? Because there's a lot of discussion in the book about uh, the difference and the, the really stark difference between the two. They, uh, the one chapter is titled The Troglodyte World, where all they can see is that little strip of sky above the trench. Trench, yes. And then when they get home, they can't adjust. They, it, they can't. The trees are beautiful, the birds are singing, and they've just come from a horrific, horrific scene. Trench life is new, right. and it is, uh, what's the, horrendous. And it's, and it's new to the, it's new to Europeans. I think Americans had a little bit of this, or at least a foreshadowing of this in the Civil War, because the trenches around Petersburg and at Cold Harbor were really not very different than the trenches around Verdun or Passchendaele. Well, we're talking about comfort food, and we'll come back to, to this idea uh, of what was actually happening. Uh, I'm going to be making a, what is a dish that we call in our family comfort food. It's mm -hmm. some chuck roast that you cook and cook, and then you add chopped potatoes and carrots, and then I put in some chunks of onion, and we cook mm -hmm. that down. And when my children come home, that's what they want right? when they're visiting. So that's what I make. So I think that came from this whole concept, the British I think so. food, too. So tell us what you're doing. Well, I'm going to be making a uh, cheese and lentil savory, which is sort of similar to a hummus, mm -hmm. um, but it was a way to add uh, filling protein to a ration menu. Um, and it was usually used sort of uh, as a sandwich filling. But it also works as a dip on crackers or something like that. I'm going to make a mock black pudding, um, which again is adapting to rationing. Mm -hmm. And then uh, what is called potted cheese, which if you go to the store now and buy Old English cheese spread, this is sort of the origins right. of it, which is a way to use up the last little bits of cheese they had. Mm -hmm. Okay, good, let's get so. started. Uh, I did some uh, pre-cooking of my meat because this is a kind of a tough cut and you want to cook it for a, a period of time. And I even pre-cooked the potatoes because sometimes you wait and then the potatoes are crunchy. And if you're really hungry, it doesn't matter. So tell us your steps here, what well, you're doing. I'm putting in a cup of oats, just rolled oats, in two cups of beef broth. 
Um, you could use vegetable broth if you like, or you could use chicken stock if you like. Um, and I'm going to cook that down with some browned onions. I browned these ahead of time. I'm going to be browning some more for the other dish. Mm -hmm. And we're just going to let that cook till it gets really, really thick. And that's the first stage. This, one, this one's a two-stage recipe. A two-stage recipe. So the first stage of this is just cooking it down. All now right. the lentil and cheese savory is I a love the bit word easier. savory. And, and you know this one, the, the mock black pudding could be sweet or savory, depending on what you put in. Now, I'm putting in onions and some spices going for savory, but you could put in apples and cinnamon and allspice and make a sweet version of it uh, as well. And so when you use the word savory in the in the uh, English use it uh, you know, to cover many descriptions of food. It's not sweet, it's the opposite. It right. could be, what, intense? Uh, how would you dis use the word savory? How would you describe it and say what it is? With um, not just spicy but not sweet and not hot. Okay, there so it is, more savory. umami. Somebody might call you in Britain and say, come over for a drink and we'll have some savories. And that would be something like you're making on mm -hmm. crackers or bread uh, and this sort of thing. I'm getting this meat warmed up again. I'm going to add, I have a little butter in here, which they might have had. Of course, as the war went on, rations became, the, the food was rationed. And, and so all the ingredients are, yeah, are very simple. The techniques are very simple. But the food was always good. It was uh, hearty and tasty. We don't have any peas in this meal. We did a show in which we talked about making peas of their usual color, which meant that was from Smith in the city. <laughs> yes, uh, which was a pre-war. Yes, uh, comic it was novel by Woodhouse. Well, and, and that was something they talk about in this was uh, how idyllic the world seemed right before the war. Yes, some of these major writers that wrote poetry and critiques and novels, but particularly poetry of the wartime. And we don't think about that as here that war engendered poetry. Mm -hmm. But we, as you mentioned to me, like the Civil War brought out writing. And but a lot of it, and, yeah, and you have, um, you do have some poetry that comes out of uh, the Civil War. Walt Whitman was writing about that time. Yes. But where I see the literary, the American literary tradition from war that's similar to this is in the letters that people wrote home. Uh, if you watch the Ken Burns oh, Civil yes. War, they used, the letters that they wrote were lyric prose. And they used them so effectively. And the book has a lot of the poetry that came out of the war, the writings from World War I. And who were the four writers they sort of uh, tracked well, on this? Siegfried Sassoon, uh, Wilfred Owen, and Robert Graves were the main ones. And then there are several others uh, that they're mentioned, but they spent a lot of time on Graves. And I've read Graves' uh, Goodbye to All That, which is his memoir from the war, uh, which is fascinating. And I got into that because I read Robert Graves' I Claudius novels. Oh, well, that's right. Oh, my goodness. He went from one extreme to the other, mm -hmm. didn't he? Um, actually, it is fascinating. Fassell likes British writers, and before he wrote this book, he wanted to show the impact of this, these hostilities on the thought process and the expression. But remember, these writers were not your, the man, you know, the common soldier. These were right. the upper that, class. That's a, a big difference, and particularly in England. Class was much more overt. Um, Americans have always tried to at least pretend to be egalitarian, but there's very much a class system in the there United is, States as well. It's based on you know several other things, right. but um, it's not necessarily hereditary. Uh, you know, it, it's interesting how all these men, the leaders, went to certain schools, and some of them were really poor leaders. When you talk about Haig, mm -hmm. I guess I shouldn't be so hard on him, but he was a Scotsman who. He didn't see, he seemed to be very practical. Well, or maybe he was too practical. Did you remember? He had, he had a plan to win the war, and when it didn't work out, as he had hoped, he just figured, well, we'll do more of it. <laughs> oh, gosh. If we keep hitting them, something will eventually happen. Yeah. But then he, 
he is kind of moved out of that, and somebody else comes in who is a little better at it. Oh, the portly man with the white beard. Right. Well, he was a subsidiary commander. Oh, subsidiary. Uh, he was in charge of, uh, the name's escaping me right now, but he was in charge of the mines at uh, Messine, which well, was one of the big successes of the war. We but yes, there was, not, there was not a lot of value placed on improvisation and outside-the-box thinking. It was the sort of tail end of let's walk in lines across the fields and just be mowed mm -hmm. down and we'll try to mow them down first. Which, you know, again, I think Americans saw a lot of that in the Civil War. Yeah. And learned that, you know, we're not going to fight that way anymore. That just doesn't work. It's instant um, death. And uh, it's interesting, the, the main German complaint in the war, the, the one time they registered uh, what they considered a violation of the, the Hague Convention, because yeah. um, the Geneva Convention came after that, um, was against the Americans. What and, were we doing we weren't supposed to do? And this was the, the Europeans, not just the Germans, but the British and the French as well, had been using poison gas, had been torpedoing yes. ships, you know, since almost the start of the war. They complained about the Americans using shotguns in the trenches, and they considered that counter to the rules of war. So they had these rules, and you had to stick by it. You really couldn't improvise, as you say. And of course, I don't know how far you go in improvising and, and following the plan. Now, our plan is to continue. We're going to take a break. We want to come back and talk about uh, the cover of the book. It has a very plaintive look, cover, and we're going to talk about that. And that also explains a little bit about the thinking about war. So. We'll be right back. And welcome back. Our book is The Great War and Modern Memory by Paul Fazell. And we are stirring, pouring, and chopping Tell me what you're doing. Well, I've cooked down our mock black pudding, which is really just oatmeal and beef broth with some sage and thyme and salt and pepper. We've cooked it down so much it's almost a dough. And so I'm putting that in some wax paper, mm -hmm. and then we're just going to wrap it up tight and twist the ends off rather like a sausage. And is it good to do that the day before? Yes. All right. And this would need to cool. And so I did one last night. I'm just going to set this one aside. This is one I did last night. And mm -hmm. once it cools, to finish it, you just unwrap it. And it's there it is. It's a little bit sticky. Yes. But he's going to slice it and properly. Cut a slice. You know what? I just poured some glasses of, uh, of Cote de Rhone for us. So you know, oh. the French were involved in this war. And like you say, the Serbs and the Germans and the Austrians, and then we and came the in, and, and the, the Russians, Japanese. and and we finally discussed with, what, how did this war start, and what was the purpose of it? I mean, the, somebody shot the Archduke uh, and the Duchess of uh, which of country? Austria. Austria, and so everybody gets in a in a real dither about this, and it's a chain of all these countries jumping in to support each other. Right, based on treaties that have been established earlier to sort of create a balance of power. Yes. And none of it really meant much of anything to the average person and hence to the average soldier in the trenches. Well, they probably didn't even know what was going on. We'll, we'll be fine here. We'll take care of this. Uh, and so we'll just do a little... This happens all the time. It's real cooking in At a real home, kitchen. At home, yes. This is it exactly. And that's why I'm here to assist. So before, and I, and I haven't even had any wine yet. No, um, I The lentils can are cooking down, and so I'm adding the cheese, and that's just the final bit here. And the nice thing about lentils is they will cook right down to a paste, and you don't have to really measure the water. Like with rice, there's a specific proportion. Yes. There is not with lentils. You just keep adding water until you get the texture you want. Uh, I was going to hold up, well, I am going to hold up, we'll have a picture of this, the, the cover of the book, The Great War and Modern mm -hmm. Memory. This is not the picture of a victorious warrior 
soldier, leader. This is a picture of the young men that went in at age 16. Mm. Yeah, and, and there's always a few that would you know, lie about their age. And by the early. time the war is over, they have the brains and they, they, they have grown up and they've become negative and pessimistic. Mm -hmm. And this has been horrible because there was no strategy in this war. As you were mentioning to me, no strategy. And people just took sides and started fighting. And the technology had really outdistanced the tactics. Now this was the war where you had chemical weapons, you had tanks, you had airplanes used. Uh, for the first time in mass, it was the British uh, brought in the the, the tanks, mm -hmm. uh, and then the Americans came in and they really weren't outfitted. I think they had uniforms from the Civil War, and it was just uh, well. And Fazell said we just we really kind of stayed out of the way. Uh, well, because for most of the war, we were making money. Yes, and. Isn't that the case very often? Now let's put this I'll be where be you're careful with this so one. So your yes. elbow doesn't get into that. Well, I'm done with, with that. Uh, and you know, people have often said, and I just hadn't thought about this, but Germany and France and Britain, have, and particularly Germany and France, have been fighting since 1870, yeah. probably even before that, um, with the, the Franco-Prussian War, and then mm -hmm. World War One, and then. Years later, we have World War II with the same players. And, and much of it is the same unfinished business. Which is? Well, it's who's, who's going to dominate who's, who's in charge. Who's and in charge. And now finally, Europe, at least for the last, most of the last 50 years, has seemed to figure out, okay, we can share. Now all of a sudden, Britain's deciding, you know, we don't want to play that game. We want to be um, on our own, making our own uh, treaties and our own contacts. And that may or may not work. I don't we'll know. We'll see how that goes. That, that's a really interesting thing. I want to give you a toast for your, your to Doug Farmwald and his great dinner today of <laughs> comfort food. Uh, and so I'm we have done. We have French Cote du Rhone because you know, as I said before, they were they were involved here. Well, and the and the British drank French wine. They did. They yeah. did, and they still go today over. They take the uh, the ferries across or the channel. They buy their mm -hmm. wine in France and they yep. come back. And I did that with an English lady. It was great fun. Yeah. So. So this just seems to fry up till it's nice and crisp and brown. And that is a mock black pudding. Now, if you're actually British and had black pudding, it's not a great substitute, but it is kind of close. Black pudding, I thought, had to do with a lot of blood. Right. Yeah. OK. And this is just the, the it gets browned on the outside. So this, this author is so taken up with England, its culture, its writing. I think he's one of the Americans that's really more British than the British. Mm -hmm. And I think he loves the poetry and the poetry of the war that came out of it. He brings also in Second World War II writers right. like James Jones and uh, Norman Mailer, Mailer? Um, Joseph Heller. Yes. Um, and, and these are the more literary authors, not just the memoirs. Because I mean, you've got great combat memoirs from uh, like Eugene Sledge with the Old Breed uh, and writers like that. But Norman Mailer is a novelist. But yes. then he wrote The Naked and the Dead. Joseph Heller wrote a lot of other things. Yes. Uh, aside from Catch-22, Kurt Vonnegut oh, wrote Kurt a Vonnegut. lot more f than Slaughterhouse-Five. Uh, yes. But those all directly it Made come out. such an impact. Can I get you a better spatula or are you okay? No, that one's you fine. You seem to be doing just fine. Well, so we have a book of wonderful poetry and I got a little bogged down in reading it after a while and I thought, well, I better read it through the first time. Mm -hmm. but. This writer is so imbued with everything British, but at the end, after the, what do you call that? Not the, the foreword, it's the, it's the afterword. Yeah, right. <laughs> he writes, maybe the next time I wouldn't put so much English literature well, in. Right, because when you think about it, if you, if you ask the average person what novel or what literature have, from World War I have you read, most people will say, "All Quiet on the Western Front." Yes, and, and that's it's German. a movie, and it—it's—is it, that the one with Kurt Douglas? I've not seen the movie. Oh, that this the movie is excellent, but uh, and again, it's this stark reality of men die, and war is not and, a sport. It's and not, they were all schoolboys. Yes, 
And this is how we brought into our vocabulary, into the sporting uh, world, mm -hmm. words of uh, aggression and war terms. We're going to smash them. We're going to kill them on this next move. And it's just, to me, amazing how they go together. And they talk about how many yards we're going to take. And it sounds almost like an American football game. Yes. You know, how yeah. many yards are we going to take from, from the other guys? Yes, from, from the, the, the Germans. And that, but that was only for people on the staff and at home. The soldiers in the trenches never viewed it like that. And it's amazing to see how much they evolved. Because in 1914, you have the, the spontaneous Christmas truce. Oh, but that was a wonderful concept. Um, and I saw that movie, too. I love the way these things are uh, brought into movies. Uh, but I read that both the Germans and the British and the French, they had a toast on New Year's Eve. And they, and they stopped all fighting. They exchanged gifts. They sang carols. They stopped fighting. And this was unplanned, yes. and the high commands on both sides were horrified. Because I, if you can't portray your enemy as something other than human, if you humanize them, it's hard to shoot them. Yes, exactly. And I think I had read at one point that uh, these British and French, they were court-martialed uh, because of this uh, not attempt. At, not at first. Not at first? Um, because at first the, the high command, as it were, just had no idea what to do. This is too friendly. It had never Maybe the war to will end. Maybe nothing will happen now. What are we going to do? I've been training at Sandhurst for 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 years, and it mm -hmm. it's just it, it. You can see why Heller is so our our American writer is so negative about war and, and Kurt Vonnegut. They see the behinds of it. They see right. what's going on underneath. And and the British writers, you know, this comes out in Fussell's book as well, he talks about the juxtaposition between soldiers at the front and staff soldiers who still have fancy uniforms you know, with red flashing at the, at the cuffs and on the collars, which the first thing you do is get rid of that on the, on the front line because a sniper will pick that off. You can see the color, yes. And so I'm getting right here to do the last thing. This is going right. to be our potted cheese, which is a traditional English comfort food. This is leftover cheese, and this is not the kind that, you know, a little square that I might finish off in the kitchen. Right, this is uh, the last little bits of cheese. But it you, might be the last, the, the thing right. that I don't eat. I put it and make this. Right, and so if the cheese is a little bit stale, you can still do this. So this is six tablespoons of butter and then about eight to 10 ounces of whatever cheese you like. I just happen to have uh, some Monterey Jack and some cheddar. And then uh, this is a basil tomato something. I'm not even sure what kind of cheese it is. But you put it all in here with some mustard and cayenne, um, a splash of Worcestershire. And in researching these recipes, nothing really was measured. Now that's well, not that the way is, they cooked. Well, you know, that is another interesting aspect. Over time. And a splash of ale. A uh, splash of ale. Over time. We had to measure, have just the right amount, and just not do it by sight or smell, because mm -hmm. we want to sell cookbooks. We right. want to tell women, you know, you have to know how many teaspoons mm -hmm. and tablespoons, and be, and women became afraid to cook. I mean, there was so much put into it. And and up until the post World War II time, there was someone in the house who was cooking from scratch every single day. And they didn't do any mise en on plus, I mean, right. measure it out and put it in little and spoons. And so it was. I've got. I've got to get dinner on the table by six, and you kind of get a feel for how long to cook things, how much mm -hmm. you need, what spices go together. Now we're cheating a little bit because I've got a food processor. Normally All you right. have to melt the cheese down in a double boiler oh, here he goes. or something like that. We've but got I'm just going to post this. Two minutes, this. Doug. <laughs> Now, if you wanted, you could also put in some walnuts or... Yes. Um, do you want a different... Do you want a bowl like this yeah, for that? I'm going to put it right in here. In here. I mean, this is amazing. So it's a very small food processor, but it's mm -hmm. good. It's strong. It's not one of these wobbly things. And now you spread this on... On crackers or, or bread. I've brought some baguettes. I think this is amazing. It's great. Even, even today, if you go to the British Isles, um, they put everything on a baguette. We have some clear space and just look at this that you made from scratch. We just have one minute here. Are you decorating? I'm just going to do a little garnish. Just chop All some right. onions. All right. Put that over the top. And so you want to get a shot of the of the comfort food here close up and I'm going to do a little 
wiping here uh, so we look nice and tidy for your TV set. And we've had quite a time on this side, haven't we? <laughs> this yeah. has been. I'm an enthusiastic cook, but not <laughs> always the tidiest. <laughs> no, I just mean that you, the wine got in the way. Now, isn't that wonderful? Look at these savories. And for the mock black pudding, I would like to finish that with just a little drizzle of balsamic vinegar. Okay, look at this. So we, go, we have the shots, we have the food, we have Doug Farmwald here today who always does a great job because you are a student of the world. You like so many topics. Well, and it was fun researching the recipes. It's not how I normally cook at yeah. home, but finding some uh, contemporary recipes of the time and making those, it was actually great fun. Good, I'm glad you enjoyed that. It's a learning experience. Mm -hmm. And we wanna say another bon appetit we want to say thank you, and I want to say thank you to well, you. Pleasure being here. It's always a pleasure having you, Doug. Thank you. Always. And so remember, good food, good friends, good books, good history. Make for a great life. Good guests make for a good life. We'll see you next time. This WNIT local production has been made possible in part by viewers like you. Thank you. Dinner and a Book is supported by the Rex and Alice A. Martin Foundation of Elkhart, celebrating the spirit of Alice Martin and her love of good food and good friends.